15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello once again. Thank you, as always, for joining us on the Space Nuts podcast. It's all about astronomy. Episode, uh, episode 203, I might add. Uh, my name's Andrew Dunkley, and with me, as always, is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hello, Andrew. Of course, we do, we do more than just astronomy. We do um, space science and a bit of physics and mm. occasionally talk about relationships and things like that. And birds. Birds, yeah. As it turns out. <laughs> well, we'll do anything, anything. And cats. Cats get a mention. <laughs> yeah. Actually, the cat is on – he's fast asleep on the lounge at the moment, so we're not, probably not going to hear much from him. How very unusual for a cat. Yes, it's strange, isn't it? It's not often you see that. It is, rather. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, a little bit excited today, Fred, because we actually get to use our first ever audio question. Isn't that great? Uh, because we now have people uh, in, well, we now have a service where you can log on to our website and record your question with your own voice and we can drop it into the program. And we're going to do our very first one of those today, which is, uh, yeah, a little bit of a, a different way of doing it. But I think it's great that we'll be able to hear the voices of the people who listen to the podcast. So uh, that'll be fantastic. We'll get into that later. There's also a, a question about star formation that uh, has got uh, one of our uh, YouTubers a little bit confused, so we'll see if we can solve that problem. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, harmonic stars. There's one particular cluster of stars that's doing something a little unusual. Um, I'm not sure if that means it's singing or releasing a pop album or something to that effect, but we'll we'll find out. But the first thing we want to talk about today is X. 37B, the space plane, Fred. This was launched on Sunday from yep. Cape Canaveral on its, uh, I think, seventh mission. Uh, and this is the all-mysterious unmanned remote control solar flying vehicle that uh, I think in its last mission was in space for over 700 days. Uh, that's right. It, it's always um, intriguing when this remarkable vehicle is launched because... We don't know why it's going. <laughs> um, yeah. the, the, the last Which time, makes it hard to do a whole segment on. Because... Well, that's right. No, look, we can make all, all kinds of things. The last time it was launched, I think you and I might have talked about it on the podcast because we always tend to home in on this extraordinary um, space shuttle. You know, it's a quarter of the size of the, uh, of the traditional NASA space shuttle. It, in fact, was originally designed by NASA, but was very quickly taken over, I think, by DARPA, the research, Defence Research Agency in the United States, uh, and promptly became top secret. It's called the X-37B, um, and basically is a quarter-sized replica of the Space Shuttle, a few design changes. Uh, it launches on top of a standard uh, rocket, and if I remember rightly, this one is on top of an Atlas rocket from the United, uh, United Launch Alliance. Yes, it's an Atlas V rocket, and it's also got another uh, national security satellite in the, in the payload bay. But uh, as you said, um, launched successfully on Sunday, uh, declared a success an hour and a half after liftoff. It would be well into orbit by then because it only takes, you know, less than 10 minutes usually to get to orbit in some of these things. Uh, uh, that's an initial orbit, but it's probably in its final orbit now. So uh, mm. the last time it went it went up, um, when the media asked the defence agencies what its mission was, the answer was testing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's that's, an, op that's an open-ended answer. Yeah, testing. <laughs> testing, yeah. Mm. That uh, could mean anything. Yeah, that's right. So uh, the you know the the, um, the 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 missions are all all about you know they're all they're all about checking out technologies and things of that sort. And uh, one reason why it excites me uh, that this sort of thing is taking place uh, is because it you know you can look back on technologies that have been developed for uh, military space. Uh, missions which are now common parlance in in civilian space flight uh, so whatever is learned from the x-37b mission 
might very well stand us in good stead one day, and the sooner the better, uh, in terms of you know how how you manoeuvre in space. In fact, I think the original mission for the X thirty seven B, if I remember rightly, and it's several years ago now, was to look at uh, the dynamics of orbit changes, how you can. Um, you know, be nimble in orbit because changing the orbit of a spacecraft is is not a small matter. You've got to put a fair bit of oomph into it to, to to shift it, particularly if you change the orbital inclination. So I think that sort of thing uh, is uh, uh, the, the sort of the sorts of experiments that have been doing. Um, the yeah, the, um, the, the 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 home base of the X-37B, and they have, there are two of them uh, which are operated by the Air Force. Uh, their home base is the, f- um, it, it was the Space Shuttle hangar at the Kennedy Space Center. So, you know, they've gone for miniaturization. And just um, just to, yeah, just to uh, put a few statistics into the story, first flight was in 2010, uh, long, further back than I thought it was it's uh, these things creep up on you uh, and totally so far they've totaled uh, two, 2865 days in orbit um, and of course there's another three days or something since then uh, because that was as of last Sunday um, one of the uh, um, spokes people Jim uh, Chilton, who who is the senior vice president for X thirty seven B at Boeing, he uh, said a number of things that are quite nice comments on this. In as much as you can say, uh, the X thirty seven B stands on the shoulders of the space shuttle, uh, and from a common shape to a common home. That's his uh, reference to the fact that it lives in the, the space shuttle hangar at Kennedy. Uh, but what he also says is, if you add up all the missions just under eight years in orbit and one billion miles. So a lot of travelling by this machine. Quite interesting stuff. Incredible. Uh, and I yeah. think... I, sorry, just one final comment, Andrew. Sorry to interrupt. Um, you might have been about to say this, so I'll shut up and let you say it. <laughs> no, no, go ahead, because I, I was just... Ga- well, I, I, I was going to say, and this, this aircraft was, uh, or spacecraft was built by Boeing, which might surprise a few people. It's a, it's a Boeing plane. Uh, <laughs> and when you go to the Boeing website... Uh, it's got a uh, um, um, on the front page. It says purpose. The purpose of the X thirty seven B. It's three lines. It's a three line explanation yeah. of the purpose of the X thirty seven B. Yes. So they're not letting a lot of information get out too far. They they uh, and and when you when you're talking about a vehicle that's operated by you know the U S Defense Department and Air Force through the Pentagon, it does sort of set off a little alarm bell in the back of your head. What else is going on up there is is the first question that pops into oh, many yeah. minds, I'm I, sure. That's right. This is just the tip of the iceberg. This is just the, you know, this exhibit having a, a, a replica, which we should mention is completely remotely controlled. There are no passengers on board, but a replica of the space shuttle doing extraordinary things, um, you know, things in orbit and then doing its... It's uh, landing in, in exactly the same way that the space shuttle did, gliding down to a to a touchdown. Remarkable stuff. Uh, the only other thing I was going to add uh, to to the comments, uh, Andrew, is that I think this uh, launch of the X thirty seven B. Uh, was under the auspices of the new Space Force uh, in America, um, even though I think it's operated principally by the the Air Force. But I think I'm right in saying that this is the second, yeah, uh, this is the second rocket launch for the newly established Space Force. Uh, the first one was back in March. So uh, the Space Force is has got its, um, you know, got its fingers in this pie as well. I wish we had. It'd be lovely to know what it's up to. <laughs> yeah, and, and once again, anything involving space comes up with a fantastic name. That sounds like something from a B-grade science fiction film, The Space Force. Space Force, I know it does. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I did see one little article about this particular mission and it said something about experiments in space involving seeds. But that's all I know. It doesn't really say much more than that. <laughs> 
Right. Okay. But uh, as you as you say, it's a um, about the size of a pickup truck. Uh, truck. Uh, what might surprise a lot of people is that this um, this concept first came into play in 1999. So this is uh, this has been a long term venture, and it took them another um, well, what 11, ten years, eleven, 11 years, years yeah. to to get one into into orbit. Yeah. Uh, so they, they, it is quite remarkable. But uh, yeah, if there's if there's some sort of benefit to uh, future space travel or humanity in general, it's uh, it's certainly something uh, that, that need, needs to be endorsed. But um, you do you do continually tend to sort of have a, a seed of doubt in the back of your mind, and that's not what the experiment's about yeah. because of all the se- <laughs> because of all the secrecy. Yeah. Seeds of doubt. Ooh, I like that. Mm. <laughs> But there's there's so much secrecy, and I suppose yeah, you know, okay. When you're talking the Pentagon, fair enough. But uh, you you do have to wonder what else is going on. Are they you know working on new space based weapons or something well, like that? And um, yeah, it's all subject to speculation. That's right. Although um, there was an assurance, it was <clears throat> a number of years ago now. <clears throat> Excuse me, Andrew. Um, um, by the Pentagon, this was. But, you know, in, in the um, uh, in, in advance of one of the earlier launches of the X thirty seven B, that they weren't testing weapons. That was uh, an assurance that was given. So that may or may not be true now, but certainly for that particular mission, uh, nothing on board that could shoot stuff down, and probably not now yes. either. No, but um, yeah, we watch with interest. Uh, look, it's not that they're not hiding it. I mean, how do you hide a rocket launch for, yeah, uh, yeah. at Cape Canaveral? It's uh, it's pretty darn obvious when it happens. But um, that yeah, there's there's plenty of footage of this thing, and uh, it's a pretty sleek uh, machine. And it um, yeah, they talk about it. They just keep some of the actual hands-on stuff that they're doing. Uh, completely away from um, from prying eyes and ears. So, um, and and that always leads to uh, conspiracy theories and and the like. So, yeah, secrecy always seems to lead to some kind of um, conspiracy conspiracy theory, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it does. And uh, well, conspiracy busting is part of our job here on Space Nuts, Andrew. So, um, um, I mean, there, there are probably plenty of conspiracies around X thirty seven B. If we knew any more than we know already, Andrew, they'd have to kill us anyway. So it's probably just- oh yeah. Well, I wish I hadn't said that out loud. But anyway, um, there it is. <laughs> uh, we don't know how long this mission is going to be either. So we know nothing. We know nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, it could be up there for a couple of years, which is what happened last time. So, um, we we will we will review the data once it comes back. Will we yes, not, Fred? Will be tests. <laughs> yes, it's it's up there for testing. Mm. Um, there it is. Uh, you're listening. Can't tell you anymore. No. You're listening to Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Now, let's take a little break and find out more about our sponsor, ExpressVPN, rated number one by TechRadar. Uh, This is the one I use. I've been using it for a couple of years, and I love it. When I joined ExpressVPN, they were were brand new, uh, new to the market, but uh, I read a lot of reviews and did a lot of comparisons, and there was just something about their, their business model that I particularly liked and a couple of years down the track honestly can't complain their interface is very easy to use their their service is second to none Uh, I've had to contact them a couple of times about um, certain things that I wanted to do and they were brilliant so you may be wondering why I do need a VPN at all it's all about privacy Uh, do you really want big tech companies governments and others knowing Uh, what's going on with your online activity. Even if you're having nothing to hide, it just feels downright creepy. Uh, I think you'll agree. And governments are getting more and more interested in what you're doing every day. And so, yeah, protecting your privacy is what VPN is all about. And how often do you uh, run across websites that you want to get information from only to find that they're geo-blocked? This is becoming an increasing problem, but ExpressVPN solves that problem for you. Uh, Now, if you go to our special URL, you'll see quite a list of things this service can help you with, things you may never have thought of before. As I say, it's the one I use, secure, fast, and it just works. 
Uh, so protect yourself online today and find out more about how to get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's T-R-Y-E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash space for three months free with a one year package. Try expressvpn.com slash space to learn more and you'll find the link details in the show notes and on our website. Now, back to the show. Okay, we checked all four systems and being with a go. Space Nuts. Once again, I'd like to send out a big thank you to all our patrons who uh, basically support the podcast through patreon.com slash space nuts to the tune of, you know, a handful of dollars a week uh, or a month, I should say, and we, we do appreciate your support. Uh, now, some people have come to us and said, look, I, I, I'd rather do it through Supercast, and so we have now got a Supercast page which is spacenuts.supercast.tech. If you would like to support the podcast through that platform, uh, there is a 30-day free trial, which you can cancel any time, and you'll, uh, as uh, our other patrons do, get access to the back catalogue, uh, weekly um, new episodes ahead of uh, the general release, uh, bonus material, and it's a 100% commercial free offering. So uh, if you would like to be a supercaster, uh, you can do that through spacenuts.supercast.tech and it's $5 a month if you would like to do it that way. Now, Fred, moving on to our next topic, and this one I must confess I've, I've read through and it's um, yeah one of these stories that sort of has me a little bit mystified. We're talking about harmonic stars yeah. uh, particularly one particular one uh, star cluster that has um, been described as wayward in one of the articles uh, that I've read uh, so what, what is a harmonic star and what's so special about this particular cluster okay uh, so this is about stars essentially pulsating um, in a way that uh, is almost akin to earthquakes on the Earth. And it's actually the topic that we're talking about is a branch of astronomy called astro-seismology, and that sort of give, essentially gives you the flavour of it. And one of the things that always delights me about to, talking about astro-seismology is that one of its principal uh, proponents, a gentleman by the name of Professor Tim Bedding, who's at the University of Sydney. Tim and I used to work together. Uh, in fact, he was a research assistant for me back in the 1980s, probably. Uh, we built an instrument uh, for positioning optical fibres, which had the strange name of Autofred. Autofred was a, a, essentially something to help you position optical fibres in a telescope. We might talk about that another day, Andrew. But it's mm. always great to see Tim uh, in the media because he uh, has, um, not single-handedly, but certainly uh, been very much a leading exponent of this. He's taken forward the, the topic of astro-seismology in a big way. Uh, and this is one of their success stories. So, uh, Pulsating stars, many different classes of stars pulsate. Um, many centuries ago, I actually worked on some of them, which contributed to my PhD, a class called Aralyri stars, which are variable stars, and they pulsate um, by enormous amounts, you know, sort of 50% uh, of their diameter. Uh, they increase by and then shrink by over a period of about a day. Uh, so that's an extreme form of pulsation. But it turns out that all stars have small, low-level pulsations, including the sun. The sun's actually doing this vibration uh, at a level that we can detect um, because we've got enough light from the sun to do you know, radial velocity measurements of its surface. Uh, that's to say we can uh, use a spectrograph to break the light, sunlight up and read the barcode of information in it uh, and measure the... The, the, the way the surface is coming towards and away from us and looking at the pulsations. If I remember rightly, the sun has a basic pulsation uh, period of, so I think it's something like eight minutes, that sort of order. Uh, it's just one mm. up and down slightly. But when you look at the, the science of astro-seismology, and this is where Tim and his group at U the University of Sydney have done great work, uh, you find that um, it's not just 
something expanding and con contracting. There are all these different kinds of modes of oscillation which take place within stars. And um, Tim's group have pr produced over the years some uh, really neat little video simulation showing the way these stars vibrate. And it's it's almost like some of them wiggle their hip, hips, some of them are swelling one way and then shrinking the other uh, as they pulsate. Um, these are, of course, highly em exaggerated, but they give you an idea of what we call modes of pulsation taking place in stars. And the So that, so there's no constant pa pattern to this. It can be different from star to star. That, that's right. The, there is a constant pattern, but what you've got is different modes of oscillation all superimposed on top of one another. Um, so wow. think about, um, all right, the, the basic mode of pulsation, which is a star just swelling and shrinking uh, spherically. I'm doing hand motions here, Andrew. Yes, I can see that. You've <laughs> got to imagine them. Uh, but then you can, oh, all right, so it's just swelling and shrinking. But then there will be another mode where along one axis it's, it's swelling, but simultaneously it's shrinking along the other. So it becomes football-shaped. Uh, for for a while, uh, for a short time, and then shrinks back and becomes football shaped in another direction. What you can all right, well, we better clarify that because in Europe they'll be thinking, well, that's just round. That's just now we're talking ball. about you know a rugby ball here in or a, or a yeah. Yeah. NFL ball, a rugby ball. Yes, or that's right. Uh, so <laughs> it, it, it becomes a non-spherical football shape. How's that? Yeah, um, there you go. Um, and then there are many other different kinds of oscillations that can take place. Um, sort of, you know, there's, there's one I remember seeing in the simulations where it suddenly, uh, you know, the, the star becomes pear-shaped at the bottom and then so, so the, the, the oscillation changes it so that it's pet like an upside-down pear. It, it, these, these are all different modes of oscillation. And... They can all be happening at once. That's the that's the really interesting bit. You might get a basic mode of swelling and shrinking, but then superimposed on top of that, there's all these other different modes of oscillation. And that's where it all gets interesting. Now, cut to the chase in the story that we're talking about. Um, it takes us back to NASA's TESS Space Telescope, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, uh, which was built uh, and launched and is operating principally to look for the dips in brightness of stars as their planets pass in front of them. And it's been great at doing that. So we've got fantastic results. But because TESS is what you might call a photometric telescope, that's to say it looks at the brightnesses of stars, it's really good at seeing the way stars themselves fluctuate in brightness. Um, and as they pulsate, that's what they do very, very slightly. A star, mm. as it pulsates in these astro seismology modes, will change slightly in brightness. And um, so, what you can do is plot what we call a light curve. This is the way a star's brightness changes over time. And then you find that it's wiggling up and down. But what's complicated about it is that the wiggles potentially can tell you about these different modes of vibration in the star if you can disentangle them. Uh, and so, you know, you imagine a, 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 a trace of uh, the light brightness over a long period of time, and you've got all kinds of random wiggles in it. And what you're looking for is periodicity in those wiggles. In other words, you're trying to sort out, okay, there's probably a, a basic swelling and shrinking that might be relatively easy to find, but then there will be other modes of oscillation in it, which will be much harder to, to detect from that, um, from that light curve. The, the technique that's used for this um, is something which is called a Fourier transform. And it's all about uh, a process called Fourier analysis. It goes back more than 100 years, the technique, although it was only in the 60s and 70s that computer programs were able to do what are called fast Fourier transforms, where, you, where you're looking for the different frequencies in a note. And the reason why you're talking about harmonics, which is how you introduced this, Andrew, is that this is exactly what happens in a musical note. So um, if you, you know, play a note on a piano, you can tell, even though it's the same note, you can tell the difference between that and the same note played on a trumpet. And the reason for that is because of the harmonics present 
in the in the nodes. And if you wanted to analyze those in a scientific way, you would put them through a fast Fourier transform uh, so that you actually can see what different frequencies are there. Now, so that's basically what's being done in this work on looking at, um, at, at star vibrations using data from TESS. And in particular, Tim and his group, just to once again cut even more to the chase, have looked at a particular class of uh, variable stars, which are known as Delta Scuti stars. Uh, they come from uh, the, 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 the sort of, you know, the uh, archetypal example of this, a bit like the Aralairi stars I mentioned a while ago, are named after a star called Aralairi. Uh, Delta Scuti stars get their name from a particular star in the constellation of Scutum called Delta Scuti, uh, Delta being the fourth brightest um, of, those, uh, of those stars, which is why it's the fourth letter of the Greek alphabet. So Delta Scuti stars have always baffled investigators as to why the, the, the way their pulsations work. And what uh, Tim and his team have done is looked at many samples of Delta Scuti stars. I think they've looked at 60, I think I'm right in saying, uh, of this particular class of stars. Maybe not, maybe that includes other classes, but they've essentially... Um, you know, decomposed or analysed the pulsations of these stars to make sense of them. Uh, what Tim Bedding says is the, the definitive identification of pulsation modes opens up a new way by which we can determine the masses, ages and internal structures of these stars. And that is the great strength of astro seismology. There are things that you can determine from that uh, which uh, give you an independent determination of, as he says, masses, ages, internal structure. So one of um, uh, Tim's students, Daniel Hay, at the University of Sydney, a PhD student, uh, wrote the software uh, to do this, and they processed 92,000 light curves uh, of the of brightnesses of stars and essentially uh, got the results that they, they want. They've uh, actually worked out what the pulsation modes of Delta Scuti stars is. That's a very big uh, step forward because nobody's understood that before. And it's great that mm. this, uh, you know, this work is being done, uh, well, not very far from where I'm sitting uh, here in Australia. Wow. Uh, I also um, understand that this, this could also be a way of finding planets. Um, Y yes, um, I mean the. Uh, that's right. You, you you will find them by the transit method if the planet is passing in front of your parent star, but if it's not uh, and it's gravitationally disturbing the star, then there's a good chance that you could do that as well. Um, just going back though to something you said at the beginning of this story, Andrew, uh, you're right mm -hmm. about these um, appearing in clusters because uh, Delta Scuti stars are basically young stars. Uh, and when you look at young stars, you often find that they are still uh, clustered together, like the, you know, the Pleiades, uh, that little star cluster that we can see from all over the world pretty well, um, uh, not very far from uh, the Taurus, the bull. In fact, it's in the constellation of Taurus. Um, the Pleiades are a young cluster. They're 10 million or so uh, years old. Uh, they are still together. Eventually, these clusters disperse and the stars go their separate ways over time. But um, the thing about the Delta Scuti stars is that they tend to still be in clusters. And so these, you know, the, the, the what you call associations uh, of, of young stars uh, can be analysed by this technique. Um, actually, Tim Bedding's got away with words as well. He says, our results show that this class of stars, that's the Delta Scuti stars, is very young, and some tend to hang around in loose associations. They haven't got the idea of social distancing rules yet. So Tim's, um, you know, Tim's putting it in a nutshell, uh, they haven't yet dispersed into their in, into individual stars. Yeah, and there was a little bit of astronomy humour in there as well. But... <laughs> As funny as a car crash. I haven't found that yet, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, the social distancing I was referring to. But anyway, yes, um, there it is. Mm -hmm. No, fascinating and, um, and good that uh, one of your former colleagues has uh, is, is, is sort of done a, um, a, a remarkable piece of work. It's, uh, yeah, a testament to uh, to all of you. Um and and there, there will clearly be more to learn from this and, and more to um, 
to gain in terms of um, of other things that we uh, we look at in the um, in the wider universe. I imagine, Fred. Yeah, I'd encourage um, um, you know anybody who's interested in following this up to check out the astro seismology web pages, particularly University of Sydney stuff, because you'll see these different pulsation modes that I was trying desperately to describe there uh, actually played out in animations. It's worth following up. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, and, and I think the ABC did a, a good story on it as well uh, on their science page. So uh, you can look it up through the uh, Australian Broadcasting Corporation science website also. You're listening to the Space Nuts podcast, episode 203 with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Roger, you're live right here also. Space Nuts. Now, before we get into our questions, just uh, want to say hi to all our social media follow followers, whether they're on YouTube or uh, the Space Nuts fa- Facebook page or are part of the Facebook podcast group, the Space Nuts <laughs> podcast group on Facebook. I always mess that up, uh, but it's a, it's a bit of a long-winded way of saying that they're um, Space Nuts listeners that have created their own environment on Facebook to get together and talk and share uh, ideas, ask each other questions, and it, it's a lot of fun. Uh, got a, a great many people there now, so if you would like to be a part of the podcast group, uh, Space Nuts podcast group on Facebook, just do a search for that or some, you know, variation of it and and ask to join. And uh, you can uh, also uh, chat with like-minded people from uh, from the Space Nuts podcast group because uh, they're terrific people. And uh, we thank everybody for supporting us through whatever social media platform they choose. Uh, now, one more thing before we hit our first question, Fred. Um, you've um, you've been a, b- a busy boy. What what happened last week? <laughs> um, well, yeah, I had a, an article published in the Conversation, the online um, sort of news and commentary uh, um, organisation, uh, which uh, always has uh, as its uh, as its uh, subtext academic rigor and journalistic flair um, i'm not sure which of those they got from me but uh, they now have an article on their australian conversation website uh, which is called technology international bonds and inspiration why astronomy matters in times of crisis and it's really just you know asking the question well uh, in, a, in an international emergency like the, the present one, uh, is the science of the stars relevant? Uh, of course, you and I are firmly convinced of that, and a lot of people who listen to us are. But in particular, I wanted to draw attention to the fact that um, Australia is currently deeply involved in playing a leading role in building what will be the world's largest radio telescope, the Square Kilometre Array. And I wanted to show how that effort can benefit a nation that is actually focused on containing a global pandemic and, you know, um, why we should be doing that. And it turns out, of course, when you look back through history, that astronomy uh, has been a very resilient science, uh, survived uh, many, many wars, world wars, and indeed Spanish flus and things of that sort, and will survive. But it not only survives, it brings benefits to people, which is why astronomy uh, has always uh, kept up Uh, really remarkable public support and the article shows why and it's the answer is in it's in the title technology international bonds and inspiration very good well done fred and uh actually i I love that website the the conversation website it's uh it's very much worth uh, visiting uh they cover so many top topics in depth and talk to some pretty interesting people so uh, it's called the conversation dot com and um, the the australian edition is easy to find as well so um take a peek uh now something else that's exciting fred is the fact that we've got our first audio question if uh, people want to ask us questions using their own voice they can go to the space nuts website and just uh, as long as you've got a microphone um, readily available through your computer you can just hit start recording and uh, tell us your name where you're from and ask the question and it's as simple as that bytes.com slash space nuts is our website by the way b-i-t-e-s-z.com bytes.com is our parent company uh, bytes.com slash space nuts and uh, record your question there as Fraser from Scotland has done. Hey guys, uh, I'm Fraser. I'm from Peterhead, a small village in Scotland. 
I'm a massive fan of the show. I've listened to every single episode that you've ever done. And uh, I look forward to listening to all the other episodes you do in the future. I just have a question that I would like you to discuss and explain further on one of the episodes. Um, Basically, it's why does the sun have such little mass of iron compared to its overall composition? It seems to be next to nothing, like less than 1%, whereas um, the earth has 30% or 31% iron by mass which seems to be, it doesn't quite add up in my head. Could you please explain that further, how that came about? Is there a theory? Do we know why that is? Um, I look forward to hearing from you guys soon. Um, Keep up the good work. Cheers. It's nice, nice to hear a different voice on uh, <laughs> on the Space Nuts podcast. Uh, would you agree, Fred? No, I, look, um, it was brilliant hearing Fraser. It takes me right back to when I used to live in Scotland. I um, I don't think I've visited Peterhead, but uh, he says it's a small village, but I always thought it was quite a big town, so that's all right. But it's good to hear, Fraser. Thank you very it's, much. It's all, it's, all re- it's all relative. Where I live would probably be considered a small village in the right. United States, but here it's a provincial city <laughs> yes, of right. 42,000 people, but um, n- not overly big in the scheme of things. Uh, but let's get down to Fraser's question, and I'll, I'll just paraphrase the short version of it. Why does the sun have low mass, a low mass of iron? Uh, I would say because the sun is actually a male and we all hate ironing, but I could be wrong about that. <laughs> uh, that's right. Um, uh, <laughs> I actually quite enjoy ironing. It's my, uh, my, one, my <laughs> one duty that I'm good at. Uh, so it, it all comes about because what the sun is mostly made of is hydrogen. Uh, and hydrogen's the raw material of the universe, essentially. The hydrogen was formed in the Big Bang. Uh, stars form from clouds of hydrogen, uh, which are slightly contaminated by other things, including iron. Uh, so uh, when stars form, uh, inevitably they are mostly made of hydrogen and the the other elements are there from previous generations of stars which have produced that, that, that the iron in their atmospheres so that's what a star forms from but the planetary system of a star is just the kind of leftover debris and it's uh, if if you like it's largely con- consists of the things that in the star itself are just contaminants they're just you know, low-level contaminants. Uh, but th- that, particularly the dust which forms around uh, around stars, um, that's a different, you know, it's different matter. It's, it's silicates mostly. Uh, but it's also uh, has quite a, a high iron content, and that's explaining why the, the Earth itself has a high proportion of iron uh, in its makeup. Uh, it's because the, the disk of material, the protoplanetary disk that formed at the same time as the as the sun did, is really just the the, the debris that you might almost call it the solid debris um, that that doesn't you know form part and parcel of the star itself. So the hydrogen's collapsed into the star. There would be there would still be some hydrogen left that hasn't collapsed. Uh, that's why we get gas giants forming. Uh, but the, the, the you know the, the small rocky planets are just the really tiny amounts of debris that are that are formed or that are left over from the, the the formation of the star. I'm probably not explaining that very well. But it, the bottom line is that stars and planets, uh, you know, have, have essentially have different makeups. Uh, it's a great question. It's the first time, actually, in uh, 150 years of people asking me questions about astronomy. I think that's the first time anybody's ever asked me that. So well done, Fraser. Ooh. It's good to hear from you. <laughs> nice work. Well done, Fraser. And and thank you for uh, recording a question on our uh, website, and we hope we get many more. There are a, a couple, I think, that we uh, haven't got to yet. Uh, some some of the questions we get, we've answered in previous episodes. So if we um, if we don't use your question, that's most likely the reason. Or we occasionally get people asking us the same question, sometimes on the same day, 
And so we will um, we'll answer those collectively from time to time. So it doesn't mean we're ignoring you, and we certainly do appreciate you getting in touch with us with your questions, but uh, sometimes we've already answered them. Uh, although sometimes we do sort of review them, which is what we're going to do now. And you, you mentioned um, star formation, Fred. We have a, a question from one of our YouTube uh, followers who recently subscribed, uh, and um, he, his name is uh, Goodfellow Jolly. I, I love the handles of people on uh, some of these these platforms. Uh, great podcast. I've been a podcast listener for several years and enjoy your humour and content. I just subscribed. I have a question about star formation I hope you can answer. It seems counterintuitive when you say that gas clouds collapsing on themselves due to gravity. Would not the vacuum of space work against any condensation of matter before gravity could um, uh, coalesce any sub, uh, substantial amount? Uh, basically, it seems any matter would boil away uh, before it had enough gravity to support any liquid or solid form. It does, um, yeah, conjure up some sort of ideas that uh, clouds in space collapsing on themselves due to their own gravity would be a counter counter move so i suppose uh, in because we did talk about this recently and it's obviously conjured up some thoughts in people's minds and, and it is it is entirely understandable actually when you think about it so if you if you think about um a liquid on the surface of mars uh that that turns into uh, a gas under uh, essentially under the vacuum of Mars's atmosphere. Mars d does have an atmosphere, but its, pres its pressure is only 1% of that of the Earth. So <clears throat> it turns into a gas. But uh, that gas is still clung onto by the gravity of Mars. And that's the bottom line here. The gravitational force is, in a sense, it is the most important force in the whole evolution of the universe because it works over big distances and it is not to be denied. It is very insistent. And so if you have, um, you know, think of the, the universe after the Big Bang, you've got uh, a universe that's largely composed of hydrogen and helium, the, the, the two products of the, the Big Bang, plus something called dark matter, which is in some ways the... Uh, you know, the elephant in the room here, and it is the elephant in the room because we don't know what it is. But dark matter mm. has um, does not interact in the same way as, as normal matter, except that it's got a gravitational pull. And we think that it was actually the dark matter that formed the seeds of where galaxies grew. So um, the dark matter itself clumped together uh, after the Big Bang. We, we see evidence of that throughout the history of the universe, and that drew the, the hydrogen towards it. And uh, it's, so it's all about gravity. Gravity overcomes everything pretty well, including the, the tendency of things to evaporate into the vacuum of space. Uh, the bottom line is that <clears throat> it's not an evaporation process we're talking about. We took, we're starting off with clouds of gas, and they indeed collapse under their own gravity. The, the, uh, the, 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 the pull of the of, of, of each individual atom of hydrogen on the next one is sufficiently strong that it overwhelms any tendency to disperse. And so you get this condensation, uh, this collapse. Uh, as the collapse takes place, the pressure gradually increases. As the pressure increases, the temperature increases, and that's how stars switch on. And we see, you know, this is such a well-established uh, mechanism for star formation uh, that it is very much part and parcel of the uh, just the accepted wisdom of the way things happen in the universe. We see evidence uh, from <clears throat> many, many different telescopes of this process actually happening. You can sort of see it taking place. You've only to think of the uh, of those fantastic pillars of creation, the images that came from uh, the Hubble telescope, you're actually seeing exactly this in process there. And there, <clears throat> those gas clouds are quite dusty, which is why uh, we've got those uh, opaque fingers that um, actually you can see through in the infrared, uh, but you can see that star formation is taking place under this gravitational collapse. 
Um, mm. I, 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 you know, I, I don't know whether that answers Goodfellow Jolly's question or not, uh, but it is the way it works. And I, I guess um, what I would point to is the mathematics of this. The, um, you know, the, the theory is well established. It works. Uh, it is the way stars are formed. Wouldn't you love, Fred, as an astronomer, to be able to get so close as to see that moment when the star is born inside the cloud? Uh, I know you say we can see star formation, but we, we, would, we po- surely cannot see that exact moment of initiation or ignition or whatever it is yeah. that births a star. The thing is that that, that, um, you know, that process of initiation or ignition is a good way to put it because that's what happens is the nuclear processes switch on. It probably takes um, a million years. <laughs> uh, oh, so I thought it would be something that happened like snap of a finger. Um, well, it, you know, it, the, it, what, what is going to happen is that you will get this cloud of gas which will have a uh, temperature differentiation in it uh, and at the centre, at the core of it, there will be high enough temperatures that you start to get nuclear processes. But um, that, uh, I think the process to get from there uh, to something that looks like the sun is probably quite long. I need to check this because I'm sort of thinking about things that I learned many, many decades ago. Uh, but, yeah, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of years, I think, would be the switch on time. Uh, maybe, mm. maybe not quite as much as that, Look, but it's not, it's not an instant. It's something that would happen gradually over time as more and more of the centre of the cloud uh, switches on. And, and I suppose depending on the density and size of the clouds would uh, you know, result in how many stars it's going to create That's right. And, over time. And to some extent, the mass of the stars that it creates. We, we know that in the early universe, uh, really high mass stars, 20, 30 times the mass of the sun, were commonplace, and they don't last long. They, uh, these supermassive stars burn up their fuel very quickly. It's counterintuitive. You'd think they'd last a long time, but they don't. They, they're very energetic. They emit copious quantities of energy. Uh, they have voracious appetites for the hydrogen fuel. And eventually, uh, before too long, a matter of just a few million years, they'll turn into a supernova. And, and that's the process that lets you spread the, you know, the heavier elements throughout the universe, uh, which is how we get planets. Hmm. It's like garden fertilisation. <laughs> exactly that. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Uh, you got a deep All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Jolly. We really appreciate it. It was, uh, it was thought-provoking and uh, gave us some, uh, plenty to talk about. Uh, thank you to everybody who's uh, sent us questions lately. We're going to get to as many as we can. We, um, we, we We've reached a point where we cannot answer all of them, but we certainly do encourage you to um, record your question on our website, bytes.com slash space nuts. Uh, we'd love to hear your voices. Uh, that's it, Fred, for another week. Thank you so much, sir. It's a great pleasure, Andrew, and, and it is great to hear our listeners' voices. I am, I'm just thrilled with that. So thank, thank you to everybody who's uh, sending in questions in their real voices. And thanks to you, Andrew, too, for using your real voice, too. Yes, um, it's certainly not an unreal voice, but uh, it is one, it is one that I've, I'm stuck with, so I, I use it to the best of my ability. Uh, I should also point out we're uh, going to upload some bonus material to our uh, supercasters and patrons, so uh, stand by for that. But, uh, Fred, thanks again. We'll talk to you again next week. Sounds great. Look forward to it, Andrew. Take care. That's Fred Watson, astronomer at large here on the Space Nuts podcast. And thank you too for your company. We look forward to joining you again next week on another edition of Space Nuts. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.